Christ. Well, John chapter 3. You heard a verse read earlier from there. John chapter 3, Nicodemus was very confused when he heard that in order to be part of this kingdom that was going to be established, you had to be reborn. (laughs) That didn't make any sense. It was unlike anything that they had ever studied. Even though there was much studying about the law, this concept was brand new. And Jesus, on the moment, on the spot, clarified at the time what would later have to be referenced in due time in Acts chapter 2. And of course, we know that chapter, the day of Pentecost, the great sermon that Peter gave by inspiration. And all these people, having heard that they killed the Son of God, thinking that there was no hope, were then told what they must do to have that relationship again. As prescribed in Scripture, the faith response under Christ's covenant is a faith-driven devotion, a faith-driven immersion in water where God and his power allows us, our spirit, our soul to be rejuvenated and recreated in the very essence of our being. That's where it occurs. And I have generously supplied in the PDF file emailed to you the extra verses for this particular study and the implications of what we're getting into for your own benefit. Um, Some of you have learned very quickly, make sure to check how many pages are on that PDF file before clicking print if you only want the Sunday morning outline. Uh, Until we get back to some kind of normal, I look forward to having that half page insert in the bulletin. But until then, I'm having a lot of fun giving you a lot more to study, quite frankly. And I just want to let you know, no flack for that. Uh, No apologies. So with this being said, what is our approach today? A unique approach, actually, for the baptized, but not like what you'd expect. Uh, I want to address a common question. In terms of any religious matter towards Christ, it has to be addressed sometime. And in our lives, it may not be addressed properly when it is time and when the questions start to surface. Through the lens of kingdom concepts, for our conclusion to this lesson on kingdom living and kingdom concepts, this series, uh, I want to look at the Sermon on the Mount, to ask this question. And let's build up to it. We've already, those of us who are baptized, immersed, partook of the Lord's Supper this morning in communion with God and fellowship with one another, we have already been immersed, hopefully for the right reasons, for the scriptural reasons, when there's a scriptural need. But for those of us who've already been forgiven, added to the church, we need to be reminded of what it takes to remain in the kingdom of Christ daily. So again, his kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom is of the heart. So let's look at our heart as we look at the Sermon on the Mount for this question. When am I ready to enter the kingdom? When am I ready to be baptized? If you're not careful, (laughs) the attempt to answer this easy question could quickly become not so easy. And while this lesson is not directly about the matter of how young is too young, I think that our time together this morning, and for those interested in further discussion and study, with the bonus materials I've provided at the welcome desk, bottom drawer to the right in the folder, the long bottom right drawer, by Wayne Jackson, there's a great article on uh, baptism of the young. But today I think that our discussion will help for certainly all of us. I always, no matter the age, praise and encourage the spirit that wants to be right with God and are beginning and is beginning to inquire about this. I always want those inquiring minds to be blessed by the discussion so that the heart is at peace, scripturally so, regardless of what may be right at the time or decision that is right. And while I don't want to ever discourage obedience when necessary, and certainly later, no question, I equally am very cautious to not mislead a soul into premature dunking. (laughs) I don't want to delay obedience upon proper understanding, and I do not want to assist I personally hope to never assist, but it's something I cannot know. And yet, I can try and prevent it as much as possible. And I have my own techniques over the years for that. But I do not want to assist in securing 
or playing a part in the securing of a lifelong false hope for when those later become accountable, whatever that is, for those separating sins which they then need to be forgiven for properly first and scripturally. If you're with me, you know what I'm saying. And hold on to the very end because we'll have a conclusion that you'll appreciate. My peace in any case, and over the past 15 years, I've baptized and helped immerse a lot of people of different ages. And my peace is in the God who knows every detail, and, and yet I do not want to mislead a soul. If those I've baptized at a young age remember <laughs> our careful discussion and later on their own develop a sound doubt as to uh, their, the condition of their immersion at the time, I hope that they remember <laughs> what they know that they can do. But thankfully, God only knows the human heart. And thankfully, that's not me to make up those calls. So I'm just thankful to assist and teach along the way. And I wonder, as a preacher, I have to wonder, how many across the world might be holding on to a memory of being baptized or immersed when there is a sincerity of heart, but before there was a legitimate accountability? Uh, I, well, obviously I take salvation seriously, and that's probably because I read and believe this book. And I hope that you do too. That's, that's the book right there. So, let's look at the Sermon on the Mount. Instead of looking to me or anyone else for that matter, let's turn to the book, Matthew chapter 5. And let's just see what Jesus begins by saying. How ingenious is this? Uh, I came across this in someone else's work, and I thought, it's been brought under my nose the whole time. And let's make a sermon out of this. We can know... When a young person is ready to be baptized, the same way that we can know when anyone is ready to be baptized. The Sermon on the Mount, the kingdom concepts right there in the Beatitudes. How many times have I read those and just never considered that's the model. That's the start for determining a person's heart. Hmm, interesting. So, at any age, as a person's beginning to take an interest in the kingdom, humans are odd creatures. They, they will, I know the church is made up of humans too, so it's interesting sometimes. We can discuss how, yes, Jesus' kingdom is of the heart, and then turn around within five minutes and have a conversation that questions what the age of a person is when they begin to gain or uh, receive that proper heart. And yet, that's the first point that we will emphasize today. There's no said age, obviously. Hmm. I just have to accept that. There's no set age. Numbers 12, uh, we could study a lot about numbers. Uh, here are some uh, verses for you. In the book of Numbers 14, the Israelites first doubted that they could take the promised land and enter it like God said. So God chose a, uh, in his wisdom and for that circumstance, he chose an age to uh, be a consequence of accountability for that sin. And he was wise. He knew more than we ever will that those 20 years and older would not live to see the promised land. They would perish in the wilderness wanderings. Does the New Testament have any similar cutoff age that we can go to? I, I can't see it. I can't find it. And when, I, when a preacher says I can't find it, there's going to be someone that gives a whole pad of paper about a verse that seems to suggest it, but the verse itself is just not there. But what about Romans 9? Paul demonstrates that newborn babes are not accountable and therefore safe. I like that word safe. Not saved, safe. They're not even falling out of the boat yet. Romans 7. Paul demonstrates that there was a status, though, that changed along the way. And when Paul references the law in chapter 7, he's obviously referring to the Mosaic law, so we have to recognize that. There was then, when Paul was born, an authoritative law, but that Paul was not yet accountable to. He grew... And he started to understand the law and realize he had ignorantly and even willfully then broken the law. And there was then a um, state of condemnation. He broke it. He violated it. So in his rearing, he became a Pharisee of Pharisees. Understandable, admirable in a way. But then he came to Christ and he learned something else. How beautiful is it? I remember when Buddy taught about certain passages and he referenced Romans a lot from Galatians. How beautiful is it that someone like Paul and his background would write epistles that clearly, beautifully declare that salvation is only in Christ, found by faith in the grace of Him alone. Wow! 
How beautiful is this? And of course, he would teach himself that baptism would be those who would realize that. So those who realize that salvation is only in Christ by grace through faith are the ones who enter the kingdom by the prescribed faith response of baptism because that's what the Lord has said. It's amazing to be taught this and to have the heart that says, okay, Lord, I hear what you say. Well, we can look at Isaiah 7. Is there an age to this? This is a pretty good marker. It talks about when the child does uh, gradually change into that point where he reaches accountability or at least a state of maturity where he can refuse evil and choose good. Okay? I think about young toddlers. They, They quickly learn when there are things around the house that are not good to touch. Uh, not, let's see, fearing not getting your hand slapped or preferring not getting your hand slapped is something entirely different than willfully violating a moral code of ethical conduct. Far different from understanding right from wrong and knowing what is good about choosing right and what is evil about choosing wrong. And yet, there is still no age set. And yes, and I want to say this to help some of you who may be thinking it, Some become accountable long before they are ready to, or long before they acknowledge their accountability, no doubt. More on that in just a moment. What about the Jews and what about Jewish culture and Jesus himself and the scripture in the New Testament that made the age 12 very popular? We could talk about that and many people do. But we still know that spiritual development doesn't happen the same for everyone Uh, If you put a young child 11 years and 364 days to bed, that young child does not wake up the next day instantly able to teach a class series to men or to women on systematic theology and Christian doctrine. It just doesn't work that way. But yet I have heard many interviews and conversations with very mature young people for their age. So see, that's the whole point. Everyone is different. And so maybe this subject isn't as complicated as we might first think. How often uh, have I preached and just never focused on how Matthew 5, these wonderful beatitudes for Christian living is also a good gauge for measuring when a person is ready to come to Christ and live in the kingdom. How beautiful is this? Right under our nose. Point 4, Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Are you poor in spirit? Are you poor in spirit? Think of this. Not a single soul in the kingdom, according to God, through heaven's eyes, is in the kingdom who isn't. So whatever it means to be poor in spirit, I had better be poor in spirit. doesn't matter how many times you were dunked under that water. (laughs) Am I living the life with the right heart? God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. He can work with those. So whatever this means to be poor in spirit, I had better be. We know it means humility. If I do not recognize my own spiritual poverty and the need for the righteousness of Christ, then while I need to be in the kingdom and repent, I'm not ready to enter it. If that's not where I am yet. I'm not mature enough to desperately, humbly appeal and submit to him to save me. Verse 3 is a picture of absolute spiritual poverty. Value, yes. But my own righteousness, no. I have nothing of my own to give back to God, to make up for the debt, or to pay it off as I live a not so good life even after that. But with His help, I'm continually forgiven. There's nothing of my own. So what do I have that God wants? A spiritual, contrite, Humble heart. I love the lyrics to the newer bridge of the song, Just As I Am. I had my personal preferences to not like that song because of its misunderstanding in culture. Some people think, hey, just come as you are. And then the unstated phrase is, leave as you were. That's not Christianity. You come to live a new life. Put away those works of the flesh. Live according to the Spirit. And I love how this song explains that beautifully. I come broken to be mended. I come wounded to be healed. I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned. I am by the blood of Christ the Lamb 
I'm welcomed with open arms. Praise God just as I am. Amen. These lyrics make it clear why we must come to him as we are because I need him. I need what he has. I am not on my own worthy. I come to him for his righteousness and I am lost without him. That is the humble heart of the one who is ready to be initiated into this kingdom. And lest it go unclarified, let's look at a devotional thought from the tax collector. We know the story in Luke chapter 18. A Pharisee was praising himself. God, I'm great. You should be lucky I'm on your side. And he, he, he didn't leave with his prayers heard. Not at all. But the one beside him, this tax collector, this outcast, this one looked down upon in every way that would be rejected. But not by Jesus. Why? He could merely, all he could say was, God be merciful to me. A sinner. Oh, that is beautiful through heaven's eyes. Beautiful. Why? Because he knew. He knew he was a sinner. He wasn't arrogant. He was humble. He knew that there was a will of God that he had violated. And this casts an extra dimension of light on 1 John 3 and 4. Read it carefully in your own time. Because whether there is a sin in a person's life or not whether it's recognized then or not, if I don't see the need to be forgiven, then I'm not ready. Oh, I might have a need, but I'm not ready. By contrast, I love to see people who read in my studies pre-immersion, Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23. I love to, to read those in a study and, and then just start to see the person uh, wiggle in their chair almost to grab my arm and drag me to the baptistry in hopes that they just help me instantly, or they have me help them instantly do what God says will allow them to tend to their sin problem. I love to see that sense of urgency because of the need to have God impute into them His righteousness by their faith. But those who don't see themselves as drowning will not grab the rope. Another illustration when we think about those who are not yet accountable and legitimately not needing immersion yet, but have a good heart. A person in a boat hasn't fallen out yet. They're safe. Only when one falls out of the boat and recognizes that needs to be saved and hopefully responds. Our job is to share that with them. Baptism then, as we're making notes along the way, baptism is only for sinners who see their need. Interesting. Interesting. Point two, like the tax collector, he knew he needed mercy. Let that sink in for a minute. He knew he needed, not wanted, I would be more blessed if I had it. No, I need your mercy, God, for I have sinned. Isaiah 59, 2 talks about our sins have separated us from God. People talk about relationships are the most important thing. What's the most important relationship? The love that God wants to have with us, but our sins have separated us from a holy God. Humanity is, accountable humanity, is in dire needs of accessing the mercy of God to then live by His grace, which is an extension of His daily mercy. Every accountable soul needs to be baptized. But it is a scriptural baptism when the soul acknowledges his or her condemned condition, then appealing to God for mercy by that accountable, prescribed faith response that says, Lord, by faith in your grace, I want spiritual redemption and rejuvenation. And this is how you've told me I can do it. Praise God. That tax collector knew, point three, that he couldn't save himself. Could, he could not save himself. The Pharisee, <laughs> he didn't walk away saved. He thought he was all right by himself. He, he didn't need anything. But that tax collector was penitent in heart. And get this, that tax collector yearned for that mercy. And he got it. He got it. It was given to him generously, benevolently, freely, abundantly because of the love of God. 
to bless that soul. This poverty of spirit is one that sees our need and sees our sin and therefore the need to come to God. That's the heart of one who's ready to be baptized. But the scriptures continue. Let's look at verse 4. Matthew 5, verse 4. How do we know when we're ready? Do you mourn your poverty? Implied by the, uh, the, the, um, the expression of the previous point, but it flows and it builds. Do you mourn your spiritual poverty? Do we pridefully say, I'm good without them. I'm a little bit better with them. No, no. Do we say, my joy is only in him. I would be lost without him. And then point B on the sub point, some people just don't mourn their sin. Worldly sorrow just regrets getting caught. Godly sorrow leads to life because it's a sorrow that leads to a change of forever leaning upon the Lord. That leads to life. And daily, the motivation to serve and please God is out of the joy of the salvation you received and you want to please God by walking worthy of it. Bring honor to the gospel that you receive. This is the type of first mourning over your sin that leads to joy in Christian living that prepares us for our baptism and carries us all the way through 2 Corinthians 12, or I should say 7 verses 8 through 11. Let's now continue. When are we ready? Are you ready to submit with meekness to Jesus? For purposes of our study, we need to see this meekness here as a gentleness of conduct, a meekness that allows uh, a higher strength to be under uh, in, in charge where your power, your strength is under control and tempered by a guide. In this case, will you let Jesus have his way with you? If we believe Jesus is who he says he is, he knows what's best, he knows what's right, and we want to follow him. Will his will rule the day? <laughs> Matthew 6.33, letting him and his kingdom uh, govern everything that we do, first and foremost. Within this sermon, let's look at some verses here. What does this meekness mean? Throughout the Sermon on the Mount, in chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, Jesus talks about walking the narrow path, staying faithful on the straight and narrow, difficult way. He talks about resisting the propaganda of the world. Down there in verse 21 through 27, he, uh, it is implied clearly that meekness means to build your whole life. And I mean your whole life. Every decision, Michael, uh, uh, your whole life. And let his will be the sum of it all. Whose will will rule the day? His or yours? If you're not ready to let him rule your life, you're not ready to be baptized. But you need to be, of course. Those who don't acknowledge Jesus is Lord are not quite ready yet. Not quite ready. But it is a humbling step. That's one of the reasons baptism and its symbolism means so much. It's very humbling to allow someone else's uh, strength to be uh, supporting your weight. And the water helps by that. It, it, uh, that's just to let you know. But then to easily get pulled right back up and say, I'm going to live die daily for Christ. Let her see who is Jesus. What are we talking about? We need to acknowledge who he is. If he is the Lord of life, the one who died on the cross. And I, when Jesus says, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly, that doesn't just say live it up, you know, make it to the full, enjoy every day the most you can. What he's saying is, without me, you're not living. So do you know Jesus as the divine will for your life? Do you know that he and his will is to be first in your life? Practically, do you acknowledge his lordship and willing to do whatever the Lord commands? If you are, then you're ready. Sub point two, when we ask, who is Jesus? Who do you know him to be? What we're really saying is, do you believe all of this? John 8, 24, unless you believe that I am who I am, uh, that you will die in your sins. He's the light of the world. He's the light of the world. I, in darkness and sin, need him. Who am I to tell God that I have a better way, I'll adapt it for me? He is the light of the world. Can you have that same confession in your heart? Like Philip did in Acts 8, 36. The Ethiopian eunuch, I should say like he, like he heard, the Ethiopian eunuch had a great study with Philip and he says, uh, what hinders me from being baptized after this study? What hinders me? Is there anything else I need to do or, or know? He says, if you believe with all of your heart. And the eunuch responded, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And the implications of what that means. Can you make that same confession? If not, 
You might have a need, but you're not ready. If you can, then you are. As it continues, what's my heart? Matthew 5, 6. Do I have a... Why, why do I want to be baptized? A, a hungering and a thirsting. What this means is, oh, I could eat. I have an appetite. Sure. No, no, no. Not just an appetite for. Do you crave in order to live for the righteousness of Christ? Because you see your condition earlier that we discussed. The question is, why do you want to be baptized? Uh, I have different techniques these days that get the answer in uh, different ways and other than just a direct question. Sometimes that still works, but uh, I prefer a different approach if I have time. In my earlier years of preaching, I've heard some interesting answers to this question. Why do you want to be baptized? If I didn't know the person, of course. Well, I've heard phrases from all ages. <laughs> because my friends were... I like good positive role models and examples, but we need to study if that's the first answer. So I can drink the grape juice on Sunday morning. Now we're talking very young. We've heard that, of course. Oh, yeah. So I can have membership perks at this congregation. Now that might not be what they say, but that's what they're saying. So that my family will quit hounding me about it. Oh. Ouch, I understand, but there's not quite ready yet. So that I, and I've heard this one. I'll never forget this particular study. This man did not come back for the second study. So that I can fool my probation officer into thinking that I'm behaving. Uh, I, that's, that's what he basically told me. None of these will lead or as a foundation for biblical baptism. None of them. Some have a better heart than others and a better direction to start on. And like we said, we praise all good intent to be right with God as there's continual learning always. However, if you crave the righteousness that you abandoned in your sin and want to have again, even more abundantly because of him generously giving, that he so freely gives, then you are ready to meet Christ at the cross because that's where it's given. And this is how we access it, by faith in His grace. Here's a further thought for you. It's natural. It is natural to have that urgency to fix the present condition. Oh, I need to be forgiven. I need to be forgiven. I want to change my life. Help me be baptized right now. Okay. Take a breath. And that was an echo in there. Okay, good. For effect, I guess. Take a breath. It's good that you see the need to be forgiven what about daily living? Have we not stressed that enough? Does that explain the reasons for the numbers that fall away? Hmm, I don't know, perhaps. But as a kingdom concept, is that the citizen of heaven primarily maintains his craving for righteousness, not just forgiveness. It's almost to a point where the more you realize you're walking in his light and, and you're mourning your own sin always, yes, the way you've, you've lapsed and fall short, but that's not even almost your focus anymore. It's, it's, I love living in your righteousness, Lord. Thank you for your forgiveness. How many see forgiveness, or in baptism, I should say, as just a, a debit card on the Lord's righteous account that you're given and you can just keep on a swiping as you keep on a, a sinning? And, and, you know, forgiveness better than permission is what they jokingly say, but that's not quite Christian, is it? The idea is, in living anyway, it, it, the idea here is, I need to walk in the light of Christ. Baptism is the start of a brand new life. I like the phrase, standing on grace, standing firm on grace. That does not mean getting close to the line and I'm on the edge of the table. It's very precarious. Don't get close to the line. You're standing in grace, pursuing righteousness. So you're leaving that line of sin behind. You're craving it. Craving it. 1 Timothy 6, 11. Um, in application, in practical terms, sometimes when you say it this way, it just sticks a little bit better. Just being dumped is not a legal stipulation obligating God to let you into heaven even if you willfully keep rejecting his will on earth. If that's the view, then we've missed the boat. Then you're not ready to be immersed for the first time. And if that's what you thought going into it or living like it now, then perhaps I'll say if that's what it was as you have reflection, then with a repentant, correct heart, penitent, correctly heart, uh, pre prepared heart to be immersed for the first time scripturally would be highly encouraged. Romans chapter 6 demonstrates... 
that if you are old enough to die to sin at baptism, you're old enough to be dead to sin and live for Christ. That's one of the reasons I love Romans so much is it just lays it on the line. In Acts chapter 2 verse 38, Peter then gives that answer, a solution to an otherwise hopeless condition. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sin and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Jesus, through God, through Christ his Son, wants a tremendously wonderful relationship with us. And he's gone to great means to secure that, but he's left that choice up to us. Let us see, maturing to overcome sin is a daily battle. We are not going to pretend that we're ever perfect. That's not the key at all. But you have the promise of Christ. You have the power of the Spirit to aid your walk. <laughs> so what are you desiring? What are you desiring? And there are more verses than we'll really have time to discuss, but you have the outline. Study these on your own. Uh, I want to bring out a few things. If you are wanting to be an example of godliness to your friends, co-workers, and family, then you're ready to be baptized. If you are wanting to be a servant to your brethren, any and all of your brethren who come to Christ unified as that one body under Christ, the one head, and if you want to do what you need to be doing and being about the Lord's business every day of your life, that's the heart, then you're ready. Side note, please don't let the devil get into your mind as he has done a very good job planting this idea across the whole world. Don't wait until you're skilled in these areas that the Lord actually wants to help you develop in. That's the whole point. Part of living the new life is to enjoy the growth process and be the people he wants us to be. Okay, I told you I'd say a few things towards the end that make it maybe seemingly more relevant in time for those who have been properly uh, immersed in the past with the right reasons, but maybe have matured to the point that they've even doubted themselves. That's understandable. <laughs> You're ready to be baptized if you desire or if you have these kingdom concepts. Yes, but also these are attitudes of the heart. So... <laughs> If you think about the present tense, perfect, present tense perfect condition of the Beatitudes, blessed is he, blessed is the one, blessed are you, blessed are you. Well, these attitudes of the heart develop in us even as we live in the kingdom life. If they're not developing or no longer there, then are we in the kingdom life? That is a legitimate question. But for those who are living the baptized life, these are attitudes of the heart that are ever increasing and maturing. And that is beautiful, isn't it? That the kingdom citizen matures in these daily. So don't think that because you have a better understanding now of your baptism that it wasn't right the first time. It might have been. It just could have been that you didn't really understand all that you were getting into, but you're sure glad that you understood what you needed to put Christ on. And that's really the key, isn't it? At every age, every stage of a person's development, and even in their Christian life, if these kingdom concepts were in your heart as motivation to put Christ on, praise God for the mercy you received at that cross, for the daily grace He gives as you walk in the light, which is again an extension of that blessing, and for the daily growth of maturing in Christ. I love studying this stuff, and I hope you've been blessed by this. But the question for you today is, are these kingdom concepts... In you, right now, either leading you to put Christ on in baptism, scripturally, when there's the accountable need and the desire to live for the Lord, or have you wandered from these kingdom concepts and realized that I need to redevote my life again? Get that 2020 vision focused on what I need to be doing, lest I think that what I did 20, 40, 50 years ago is a sure ticket in heaven no matter what I do. Let's get right with the Lord.